there are a lot of ways that we uh, talk about being a Christian, for sure. And, and in, in my earliest days as a pastor, one of the ways that was very common, if I were to probe around with people in, in uh, northeast Texas about their faith, uh, one of the common responses was, I have been baptized. And if I asked about faith in Jesus or being saved or whatever, the response would often be, I have been baptized. And um, so there's, there's a lot of ways to talk about that. Uh, phrases that are very common, I've, I got saved, um, I've been born again, I'm a follower of Jesus, I accepted Christ, I'm a believer, I know Jesus. Uh, all those do speak to one or more aspects of Christianity and what it means. All those get at something that is very, very true, I think about the heart of Christianity, but they don't necessarily all point to the heart of Christianity. And I think that God is doing a new work in the church today, especially in, um, I know certainly in my life and circles, but I think even across the West, where, where as I read authors and I hear of conversations that, that, that God is showing something about what true Christianity really is, and it points us back to what the New Testament repeatedly describes as this one thing, as the gospel. The heart of Christianity is about entering into the gospel. Now, that might be confusing if you are uh, a folk who, would, who were, was where I probably was about two years ago, where the gospel had been reduced to um, believing a certain um, set of tenets that are all true, uh, all true, that is, I'm a sinner, God loves me, he loved me so much that Jesus died for me, and if I place my faith in him, uh, that I would, when I, I would go to heaven when I die. And, and, and that's a, a kind of a, a bare-bones approach to what many people have described as the gospel. And what I spent years, if not decades, believing what was the sum total of the gospel. What I just talked to you about is a part of the gospel. It's very, very true. I'm a sinner, right? That as I, I've, I've uh, wrecked my life through sin and I couldn't save myself, it is true that God loved me in the midst of my sin, that he loved me so much that he sent Jesus into this world. And Jesus not just being sent but voluntarily going and to stand in my stead as a human being to live a perfect life and then die a sinner's death and then be raised by the power of God to defeat death once and for all so that ultimately, truly, that when a person places their confidence in Jesus that, that there is a transaction of sorts that is the old life is gone and a new life comes and the new life does ultimately end up, we ultimately result in this, this perfect relationship in paradise with God that we know and call heaven. What that leaves out is all of the space between our profession of faith and the end of our physical life in which the gospel is lived out, experienced, and proclaimed. So, as we talk about what the heart of Christianity is, we talk about it in these terms here at Covenant, that it is learning to do life with God in community. So we're going to begin talking about that more and unpacking it a little more. So the first part of that is going to be life with God. We're going to talk about what does that mean? Because that's really what Christianity boils down to is, the, is that phrase. You can use different words. You can use different analogies if you want. But bottom line is what, what Jesus invited people to do, to, to enter into, was life with God. And, and so if anybody were to ever ask you, what, what is Christianity about? It really would be a fair and fairly comprehensive response to say Christianity is about doing life with God. And if they were to ask you, or if you were to ask, do you mean this life or the next life, you could say yes. Yes. Wh which one? Both. Because when you enter into the gospel, you enter into life with God, it becomes, according to Jesus, a seamless transition. It's just one life called what? Eternal life. I would say today, because of confident in Jesus, not confidence in me, because of trusting confidence in Jesus, that I have entered into eternal life. Right now, I haven't died yet, but the life and the quality of my life that I have now entered into is, is, is what Jesus would describe as eternal life, or life in the kingdom of God. So, it's not the only way in which Jesus announced what his mission was. He used other phrases and concepts in, in terms of, of this, uh, that is... Matthew had described Jesus as going around 
proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He doesn't say that Jesus went around proclaiming how people should get saved. He doesn't say that Jesus went around proclaiming that people should join the church or ask him into their hearts. He did go around much proclaiming the gospel, the good news, of the kingdom. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are interchangeable in Jesus' phraseology. And when he uses one, he means both. That they're just two different phrases meaning the same concept. And we're going to talk about what that means. Gospel meaning good news. And the kingdom referring to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So Jesus' description of Christianity is the good news about God's kingdom. And that we get to live life in it. We get to enter into it and live life in it. And this is not, the, like I said, it's not the only way. Uh, like John 10.10. 10, he said it was about abundant life. Jesus said, hey, the, the, the enemy... The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give them life and life more abundantly. And then John also writes, he said, he who has the Son, he who has the Son has, isn't that an interesting phrase? I have the Son, has the life. And, and there, there, the word the is in there, the, the life, 1 John 5, 12. And again, he wrote in John 20, 31, he says, but these have been written, these things have been written so that you, that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the, the one who's come to redeem mankind back to God. He said, the Son of God, and that believing, placing confident trust, which we talked about what Maggie had done, by believing, you may have life in his name. Does that mean life when I die or life now? Yes. The, the invitation of Jesus, the heart of Christianity is yes there. So all that to be this very uh, broad, sweeping introduction to a message, to a series that we're going to call Life with God. Doing life with God. If you just read through the first four books of the New Testament, it becomes really clear that the original description and declaration of what it, of what it meant to be what we call today a Christian is to just begin doing that. To begin to do life with God. Indeed, Jesus' invitation to his very first disciples was nothing more, nothing less than an invitation to do life with him. Come follow me was an invitation not to just learn about Jesus, not to just learn the tenets of Christianity, but to begin to do life with Jesus very, very literally. And I would say to you, I would suggest to you that the invitation has not changed at all. That Jesus' Jesus's words through the Holy Spirit spoken to us, the invitation, come follow me. The invitation that Maggie has responded to, the invitation that others of you in this room, many of you in this room have responded to is the invitation to come follow me. That is to do life with Jesus. So this is a very important statement. Not only to know, because we're trying to regurgitate a church mission statement, not only to just know it that way, but to embrace it's a it's a it's a message to embrace and here's why it's a message to embrace because it's really not about our motto or our vision statement our mission statement it's about this is the phraseology of the gospel this is what Jesus has put forth for us to receive into our lives that is to do life with him and, and to do it in community with others and I'm convinced the understanding of Christianity is is summed up I think very effectively in that phrase. I am not saying that there are other phrases or ways to say that that are just wonderful or even better. But for us, at Covenant Baptist Church, this seems to be the phrase that the Holy Spirit has allowed to settle into our culture and begin to define us. That is to do life with God and community. And it's something I am praying and longing would get deeply embedded into our congregation, to our hearts, since the purpose of this series of messages entitled Life with God. And so as we kick this off, as we begin this, a very basic but incredibly significant question, what is this life? What is life with God? You should be asking that question if it's not already been answered for you in some time past. Because if we're going to say Christianity is about doing life with God, that is a pretty big statement. And it has not been fully explained nor will I ever be able to fully adequately explain all of the ramifications of that, but we can get 
into the very heart of that. So we're going to ask that question. We're going to dive off into that. We're going to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to do some work here in our lives and communicating to us to give us a deep-seated understanding of what does it mean to do life with God. Because one of the words that is important, uh, that I, not just important to me, but I think God has impressed on me for the year is invited or invite. And so as I want to invite people to live life in the kingdom, to do life with God, I want to be able to give voice to that. I want you to be able to give voice to that. I want to be able to articulate that in a way that doesn't sound like a preacher. One of my hang-ups is, even in talking to my own family, is I don't want to sound like the preacher. Uh, it's a danger uh, of the calling and the vocation. So I don't want you to sound like the church member that's out recruiting other members. But in, I, want, I want us to be... And I think this is the heart of God for us. I want us to become this church who is living life so vibrantly, so authentically in the realm of God's kingdom, doing life with God, that the invitation is to do life with God, with you, with others. And if that happens to result in somebody doing life together in this community of faith, beautiful. But what if they live out of state and they have to return home? Have we failed in inviting them? No, because our invitation at the bottom line is always going to be Simply this, to do life with God in community with other believers. So, we are going to describe life with God in three foundational ways today. Now again, let me say that when I wrote this, I thought, wow, that sounds presumptuous that I could describe a life with God in three phrases. <laughs> so, I, I, I wrestled with God on that a little bit and just saying, God, I, I just don't like trying to do that. Here's, here's what I sense that the Spirit said back to me, was, I never said that you were going to describe everything perfectly, <laughs> the, to which I felt great relief. Uh, so I say that because I don't want you to think that I am, I think that we can reduce life with God into three simple phrases. I don't. There will be much about life with God that I simply could never exhaust or or put into even a year's worth of messages. Okay, That's not the goal, is to exhaust and descriptively exhaust what life with God is about. But I do think that we can put some foundational truths and phrases and ideas and concepts into our lives so that we can understand it better and we can talk about it more effectively. So that's the goal. So if, you're, if you go through this and say, well, you didn't talk about this, and that's part of life, let's just go at the assumption that I'm going to leave some stuff out. All right? Because I think I'm, I know I would talk until Jesus returned if I, was, if I were even going to begin to uh, tap into all that life with God means. So, biting this big thing off, um, there was a little reluctance on my part to even do this because, again, it seems enormous to me. But I truly sense that the Spirit is, has led us to this point and led me to say the things that we're going to say today. So, I'm going to throw myself at his feet real quick if you would join me in prayer. God, I know this is way above my pay grade. I know that I speak of things that I knoweth not. I know today that I'm in over my head. And that is a glorious place to be because I really am at peace. And I do feel a sense of confidence that your spirit will speak well. And Lord, I trust you to do that above and beyond my clumsy words or poor illustrations or, 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 or misreferencing a scripture or, or all the stuff that I bumble through every week. God, I believe that something significant needs to be said today. And I believe you are the one that wants to say it. And I have this joyous privilege of being able to be the mouthpiece today. Uh, an inadequate, um, broken mouthpiece. But God, I'm willing. And I believe that I stand in front of a congregation of people who's not only willing to be here, but they're willing to hear. So I pray that for all of us. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to know that we can live life with you and invite others to do the very same thing. So we throw ourselves at your feet in utter dependence and confidence in you. We love you, and you loved us first, and that's the reason. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's three things that I want to talk about that I feel are important for us at this point and juncture in our lives that will help us kind of get our mind around what we mean, what we're talking about when we say the gospel is, is the declaration 
that we get to do life with God, that there's an invitation to do life with God. And first, so we're answering the question, what is it? What is this life with God? And the first thing we would say, it is life in the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to walk through that, but, but understand that, that the very first thing that I think God would say to Covenant Baptist Church gathered here is that, that Christianity, doing life with God, is about living life in the realm of the kingdom of God. Now, that brings up another question. Where is the realm? What is the realm? So as mentioned earlier, there are the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably, according to Jesus. Dallas Willard, one of my, my mentor authors, certainly he, he, would, he would affirm the very same thing. So I feel confident in saying that, that those are used interchangeably. They both refer to this. The realm, and, and these are Dallas's words, the realm in which God's effective will is carried out. Does that mean that there's an ineffective will of God? No, it just means the realm in which people are surrendering and pursuing to seek and to know and to carry out what they understand God's will to be. There's a yieldedness to do life like God would have us to do life. A freedom there, not a legalism, not a I have to do life or else, but an entering into, a voluntarily entering into a yielded submission and trust so that you do life as God leads us and teaches us to do life. That is what it means at a very basic level to do life in the kingdom of God. It is following and carrying out the will of God and His effective will, His intentional desired will for us and for the world, for the universe in fact, that we're entering in and participating with God into that realm. So it's not a geographic realm, is it? It's not here at 54, or what is our address? 5440 Southwest 37th Street. I thought it was going to say 5770. I don't know why. But it's not, it's not, this isn't the address of God's, can it happen here though? I, absolutely. I hope so. Does it stay here? Is it contained here? Because we're singing here together and preaching the Bible together and saying religious? No. But it can happen here and it, and it can radiate out into our lives. In fact, the, the concept is that it would, this would be a hub of energy and enthusiasm and mutually shared faith and encouragement that would spill out into the world around us where we would go from here to live in the realm of God's kingdom at work in our home and our neighborhoods and our cars at the grocery stores and our places of business and the places of hobbies and all of that stuff that we would begin to live our lives like that which is how we functionally become witnesses to the world so the first thing we would say is doing life with God Doing life with God is living life in the realm of His kingdom. Now, if living life in the realm of His kingdom is about doing the effective will of God, we have to understand what that means a little bit uh, more clearly than maybe I've made it so far. But I want you to know that I believe the Scripture makes this clear that while obedience to the will of God is paramount, it is not what justifies us. Our confidence in Jesus brings us into right relationship with God and makes this even possible. But hear the words of Jesus about living in this realm and how important it is. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who says those words will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's a shocking statement, isn't it? I mean, if you listen to Jesus' words, he said, hey, you can call me Lord all you want to. That that does not qualify you. That does not mean you're entering in to life in the kingdom. Then what does he say after that? He says, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Because we have been so ingrained with the concept of inviting Jesus into our heart as the prerequisite to getting into heaven and that, that works have nothing to do with this whole process uh, and that we are scared to death of talking about obedience to to teachings or obedience to God we misunderstand this we read this and kind of shudder and go well I thought if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus the Lord will will be saved true true very true he's not saying that it's not true he is simply saying that word or word alone just simply calling Jesus the right thing is not the sum total of what it means to enter into life but we enter into life, into the kingdom of God, here and now and forever, by doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. You could hear it 
And Jesus is teaching on prayer too, can't you? Your, let, 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 may the kingdom come and your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Obviously we can't, in the limitations of our humanity, carry out the will of God without fail. Living in the kingdom of God doesn't require perfection of practice. It, it is an urgent, pleading, sincere call to a sincere intent and a desire and a willingness to surrender and obey, to practice obedience. And you can hear this truth in Jesus' words when he said this. He said, anyone who loves me will what? Invite me into their heart? That's not what he said. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Because loves me means I love you enough to obey you. Love me means I trust you and I have confidence in you. So he says, if you love me, you will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. Listen to this. It gets just even more beautiful. My Father will love them and we will come to them. Listen to this. We will come to them and make our abode or our home with them. In John 14, 23, listen to the relationship of God's rule to the kingdom of heaven that Jesus makes in Matthew's gospel. He says, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So, if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Disobedience to the teaching, disregard for the teaching, a lack of, uh, of regard for the commandments. Jesus describes this as resulting in the least in the kingdom of heaven. But listen to what he says. The opposite is true. But anyone who obeys God's law, who begins to do life as God prescribes, and teaches others, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There's clearly a correlation to living life in the kingdom and being obedient to the teaching of God because God is not trying to encumber us with rules and regulations that simply placate a dictatorial, hard-hearted, cold, distant God. He is calling us to live life in the way in which He designed us to live life that we can enter into life that is abundant and full and free. But in our stubbornness, we refuse to want to follow laws and rules. We don't want to be imposed upon, even though the pleading of God's Spirit is entering into real life, good life, rich life, beautiful life. We still put our hands up and say, nope, 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 don't, don't, don't encumber me with rules and regulations. I'm saved only by grace. You're justified by grace. You're completely made right by but if you want to live in the realm of God's kingdom and experience the kingdom of God, Jesus makes it so very clear that that is about learning to obey and live according to the teachings of Jesus. Life with God is lived in the realm of His effective will. It is life that is increasingly lived as we were intended and designed by God to live it. So there's no better life. I'm going to talk about this in a later part of the series. There's no better life. There's not one than life with God in his kingdom under his rule. You can hear it right here in Jesus' words. Uh, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, he said, Come to me, all you who are weary, le- weary and heavy laden. This is his invitation to this life. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the first foundational way to understand life with God is that it's life lived in the realm of God's kingdom. Living life in the realm of God's kingdom is learning to live obediently to the teaching of Jesus. And the next foundational way to understand this life with God is that life, it's life lived in fellowship with God. I know these things are dovetailed and I know one bleeds into the other, but I think there's enough uniqueness that, that, that demands that we speak to it uh, individually. Uh, but understand that they, one bleeds into the other. So it's life lived in fellowship with God. Now, I get excited about all of the things that I'm talking about, but I really get excited when I let this soak into my life. That I get to live like the invitation to Christianity is to not live life for God. You, you quote me on that all you want. Write it in social media. Tweet it out. Whatever you want to do. Life, Christianity is not me doing my life for God. Christianity is me doing my life with God, 
in fellowship with God. Because I can do life with God, and, and, and that may, might mean that I'm doing life with a hostile, angry, dictatorial God. But the invitation of Christianity, the communication of Jesus, the teaching of the New Testament is that we get to do life in fellowship with God. Think about that. When we used to uh, pastor and serve in Texas, we had, every church had, a fellowship hall. This is kind of intended to be a fellowship hall. But the fellowship hall in Texas was almost always used simply for food and fellowship and fun. It was, I mean, it was that's just where you served food and hung out together. Now, if you're me and you're in rural east, northeast Texas, you also processed wild game in the fellowship hall. <laughs> to no chagrin of my church members who would come by and say, do you have enough to share with me? <laughs> so the fellowship hall was designed for that. It was built for that. I think it's a good thing. I really think that it points us to something, not suggesting we need to have a building program or anything, but I think that it gets to something that fellowship, this koinonia, this, this joining together of our lives, this intermingling of our struggles and our victories and all of that that happens in community, which we're going to talk about, is also the very same invitation God gives to us that we get to, to intermingle our lives with a God who is benevolently, mercifully, graciously, lovingly, patiently by us and with us. I am not living my life for God in the terms that he is some distant CEO, some aloof boss or authority that is unrelated and unconcerned, that I am constantly trying to placate, that I'm constantly trying to keep him happy. No, 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 no. I wake up and the God that is revealed in Jesus steps forward into my day with me. He is for me. He is at my side. He is, not, he is not here to serve me. I am here to live for his glory completely, 100%. But the majesty and the wonder of the gospel is that my God, who is the king, who is a ruler, who is the sustainer of this universe, literally says, I can do this day with him, and he is for me in this day. He wants my good. He wants my blessing. Listen, I seek to live for the glory of God, but I will never glorify God when it is not to my blessing. I will never do anything that does not point to the glory of Jesus that is not profoundly for my good. And God will never do anything for my good that does not profoundly shout His glory. That does not point to His radiant goodness. That does not declare with, with infinite, infinite glory that He is a great and good God. Just because I would say to you today that God is with me and for me and seeks my good does not counteract, does not stand in opposition to the fact that glory goes to God alone in that process. I don't have to be in solemn, quiet prayer to glorify God. But I can. I, I could be at the grocery store and bring great glory to God even in the smallest of details, by finding a good deal and saying, thank you, Jesus. Or as, or as my wife has, has, has taught me that when there is a parking place, especially when it's negative 12, in the first two or three spaces in front of the grocery store, that you don't just park there and say, I'm fortunate, but you say, thank you, God. To, to all the way to the point where we get to see a young girl say, I am a Jesus follower. What a blessing. That way we get to do that kind of life with God, with Him. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring to you. You probably have an idea. You probably have some speculations. on. But I know one thing for certain. You get to do, you have the chance, you have the opportunity, you even have the open invitation, the longing of Jesus that you can do whatever tomorrow brings to you. You can do it with God. From about November to February, most of our Saturdays are spent in a gymnasium watching wrestling. I always wondered why I profoundly enjoy that sport and why I love watching my kids. I always wondered for about two of those years, why do I always feel such a funk after I do that? Enjoying it as much as I do. My family thinks I have an obsession. I might. 
But I wonder, why do I enjoy it so much but feel such a funk when it's done? And here's what I knew. Here's what God showed me. Is that, Casey, while I have, I have, I have, I have given you this blessing and while there's nothing wrong with enjoying this sport, is that you leave me completely out of it. I don't cross your mind. I, and I didn't feel shamed by this. I'm not saying God was wagging his finger at me. I just didn't like the result. And so bringing it back to God, the, the response in sum total was, you're not doing that day with me at all. You're taking a vacation. And you can do that. And I was getting everything you could get out of that sport without God. Which was momentary exhilaration or momentary utter, you know, defeat. Or, you know, when you live in your life uh, watching kids on a wrestling mat, there's the highest of highs and lowest lows. And no matter what happened, I would always get to the end of the day and go, golly, I just feel kind of in a funk. But a couple years ago, God just began to woo me into that and just say, hey, where am I present in this day? How do you notice me here? And boy, I wish I could say I got it down in a year or two years. But there is now a regular reminder of the Holy Spirit in my life to be present with those around me. I'm not always good at it. I'm not always perfect at it. But I am much more aware of the presence of Jesus in, in, in old days, I would have probably said, I just can't do that anymore. If I want to, I just, you know, it's something I just, it just takes me away from God. And, and no longer. We are invited to live our lives in fellowship with God. Listen to John 17, 3. I don't know they could get any more clear. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. The one, only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. This is eternal life. That's what he said. Now in John 14, 21, just listen to these words. Let them hit you just as exactly as he intends for them to hit you. He said, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. We read that. And he who loves me, listen to this, he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him, Jesus said, and I will disclose myself to him. Do you know I was in a funk at the end of the day? even though I had a fun day doing something I enjoy, is I had never let Jesus disclose himself to me in those gymnasiums. I just did life on my own that day. How rich it becomes no matter what it is when we learn to live life in the kingdom, present with Jesus in fellowship with God, Here's what, here's what 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 says. It says, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. So he's proclaiming the gospel, and here's his gospel. Here's what he says. That you too may have fellowship with us, meaning the, other, the, the disciples. The lead. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Life in the kingdom is about fellowship with God. And it is thirdly, life that is eternal. You might have started with this one, right? Because this is what we think. Eternal life. Man, if I get saved, I've got eternal life. If I get saved, when I die, I'm going to have eternal life. When you die, you're going to enter into eternity. I'm not... I, I, let me tell you something. Eternal life is, is not just a duration. We really think of it as a duration, like never. And, and when we do think of it, we oftentimes just think of it as life that never ends. But if you look up the word eternal, it means life or it means without beginning or without end. Now think about that. You didn't, you didn't start eternal life when you got saved. You didn't start your eternal life. You entered into eternal life that had no beginning and has no, you're stepping into the middle of a, a river of life that had no beginning, that has no end, and qualitatively, it is beautiful. And it also has these hints, these aromas of beauty to it. Not just, not just talking about the duration, that no beginning, no end, but eternal life, and we're going to have to unpack this more later, but eternal life, life is about quality of life as much as it is the duration of life, the kind of life, the nature of life. This is why John said of Jesus, in him was life. When Jesus stepped out of heaven and he stepped onto the plane of our world, he stepped in as life that has no beginning 
and had no end. And that's why he said, come to me and you find what? Life. You enter into life. That's why Jesus said of himself, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Man, I, I don't know how long I spent kind of messed up. I always thought of eternal life as something that I got that started. We talk about it like this, even in Southern Baptist circles, very, very commonly. When did you get saved? When were you born? When did you ask Jesus into your heart? And then we talk about it and we think about it. It's like, that's when my eternal life began. And that's even in the best of circumstances because many times we'll think of eternal life as something that starts when we die. Well, then I enter into eternity. <laughs> Not according to Jesus. You step into life with Jesus, you have stepped into a life that never has a beginning, never has an end, and is beautiful the entire time. His life with God is eternal. The Apostle Peter answers a really good question for us. That is, are we entering a life that lasts forever but is gradually declining? Does it change? Like, I, like something lasts forever, we always think, well, it's, it's kind of like the food that's in your refrigerator that's at the back of your shelf. And you go back there, and you pull, if smart people do this, I, I don't necessarily do this. <laughs> I just eat it if it's available sometimes. But if you're smart and you pull something from the back of the refrigerator, you would look at the expiration date. If you're even smarter, when you put leftovers in the refrigerator, you do it. My wife is really trying hard to get us to do, and I'm seeing the value more and more, although I'm not really good at doing it yet. But you label it, and you say, you know, chicken, 1, 12, 18. Because if you don't do that, chicken that was made on 1, 1, 18, and you're trying to eat that chicken on 112, it's not, the, the quality has diminished, right? To the point that it could make you very ill, right? Or if there's, if there's a bottle product, you can see expiration date. Or, you see what I'm saying? The, the newest of cars, five years later, doesn't, there's a qualitative difference, right? Clothing, right? How many pairs of shoes do you have that you thought, hey, I love those shoes when they first, then they get old. So the fair question is, this, what, how does, what's the enduring nature of eternal life? If it's going to last, if it has no beginning, it has no end, doesn't it get a little old? Doesn't it change a little bit? Doesn't the glory diminish? Don't you get used to it? Even new things, and we're so accustomed to that, but not according to Peter. Listen to these words, and we're going to be done. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is excited. Man, this is a declaration of joy. He said, who according to his grace and mercy has caused us to be born again. We've entered into the life, life with God. We've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain. That's where we get to obtain an inheritance, <coughs> eternal life. We enter into it. And he says, this is an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven. I can't wrap my mind around it. I've tried all week, just particularly this week. I've, this passage of Scripture, I can tell you about the first time I read it, 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 way back when I was in college, and I was wrestling with it then. I'm wrestling with it today. I think I have a greater understanding, but I still feel like a novice. But I'm telling you, when you enter into something as glorious as life with God, and then to try to fathom that that glory is never going to diminish. It's never going to fade. The joy, the, the brilliance, the goodness, the richness, the love, the, never gets less. In fact, from this point on earth forward until we are uh, brought out of this broken wreck of a world, it gets brighter and brighter. The day dawns brighter. Just If, if you want to think about it in a very literal term, just watch the sun come up. And you will see the nature and the quality of life with God on this earth. He gets brighter and more brilliant and more astounding the longer it goes on on this earth. But even when eternity brings us into the realm of undefiled presence of God, sin and death is absolutely abolished. Even then, it never diminishes. Now I'm telling you, if, if the gospel had been explained to me like this the first time, I would like to think, I, I would like to think, I might not have been this smart, probably wasn't, 
But knowing what I know now and looking back then, I would have taken somebody by the lapels figuratively and said, give me this life now. I don't want to wait. i got to have this now. What do I got to do? How do I go, go about this? I want to live this life. But, but so often we're prescribing to people to say, hey, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you got to believe in Jesus and go to church and be a good person, and then it'll all work out in the end, but just hang on because life kind of stinks until then. It's hard, and it won't be any different than anybody else. Well, that's not very compelling. But the gospel that Jesus proclaimed is breathtakingly compelling. So church, let's do this. Let's live life with God. Let's live every moment with Him. And so here's, I don't have this again on a, the reason we don't have anything is a combination of sickness and forgetfulness. And when you combine, when you get a sick Annette with a forgetful lead pastor, what you get <laughs> nothing <laughs> you don't get a listening guy you don't get a... all right so let me just tell you this and we're done christianity if we're going to talk about it and, and i'm this isn't going to be your only shot at this but let me just tell you if you know they have talking points for politicians and whatnot poor analogy i'm sorry but i'm going to give you some talking points this if you're going to explain or or verbalize or communicate the gospel or what it means to live life with god here's here's three things i just hope that you would remember and again, we'll put these in print sometime because it's easier that way. It's life with God in his kingdom. It's life with God in his kingdom. It is life lived in fellowship with God. Okay, that describes how we are living life with God in his kingdom. It's in fellowship that is healthy, loving, good, gracious relationship with God. Unhindered access. Isn't that good to know? You have no hindrance of access to God. You don't have to wait in line. You don't have to wait for him to respond to a text or, or, or reply to a Facebook post or, or whatever. That you have unhindered. You can barge into his presence with your brokenness or your victory. It, you have unhindered access. You can go. He's, he's thrown the doors open wide. So it's life lived in fellowship with God. And thirdly, it's life that never ends and never fades. It has no beginning, no end. And, it, and the quality of it never diminishes it never gets less beautiful or glorious now as we talk more and more about inviting I think that's something we can that's something I can invite people to I am so thankful that we have a merciful God that has taught us slow to learn pastors some incredible things through people and books and authors and experiences and pains and victories Man, I couldn't be more excited about where God is taking us. And I hope that you can wrap your hearts and minds around this and simply walk away today knowing this Christianity, at least the first part of the statement is what I want you, is life with God in these ways. Christianity is life with God in these ways. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so astounded, and it is so hard for me to use this incredibly limited vocabulary to talk about things of this nature. So I'm desperately uh, in need of communication of the Holy Spirit in the lives of this congregation, but even in my own life, God. I don't have words or concepts to fully grasp the beauty and the glory of life with you. But we do have words, and we do have concepts, we do have phrases, and we can, we can enter into that kind of, of dialogue. And, and, but first, God, but first help us to enter into a life so that when we do speak, we speak of a life that we are living and not just a truth that we are believing. God, give us an experience so that we have a voice. Give us a life so that we can share it, not about it. Lord, you lead us to become the congregation you want us to be. Not that I or the deacons or the elders hope, but the life that you want us, the congregation you want us to be. We say yes and amen to it right now. It is the great, glorious name of Jesus we pray.